Okay, uh, so now we'll be starting our uh, next topic uh, that is uh, that is likely to continue for for the next week as well, right? And it is object detection using deep learning. Okay, so naturally I'll introduce you to how object detection is different from classification and what we would expect, right? So basically the whole uh, objective of this session or rather this topic would be that once you are given with an image, you are able to identify what are the different objects present in that image, right? And where those objects are present, okay? So this is the ultimate objective uh, for which we'll see different deep learning based model, right? So what you see on your screen is the output of uh, an object detector where it is giving you the bonding box where an object appears, the label of the object, along with the confidence score, right? The percentage that you see, it is actually the uh, confidence score of that uh, particular model, right? So by the end of this discussion, we would be able to um, develop models like this, or at least borrow from literature so that we can implement something similar to the output that you see on your screen. So this is the ultimate uh, goal, okay? So before moving to object detection, um, we see throughout uh, the first uh, half of this semester, we have been looking at the image classification problem. So image classification problem basically takes an image and it gives you the class label of the object present in that image along with the probability, right? For example, if you feed this image on the right side of your screen, so we expect that it will give a high probability for the object dog and a less probability for the object cat if it's a two class uh, classification problem. <clears throat> So once we started our discussion on CNN, we, we said that um, since 2012, um, whenever you are talking about classification problem, the first thing that you explore is always CNN, right? Maybe today you will not go for conventional computer vision based features and conventional classifiers to recognize an object. Maybe you will say, okay, as a first try, I should go for CNN, right? So they are like the gold standard for image classification today. When you look the world around you, it is much more complicated than simply a classification task, right? For example, if you if you go out on the road and see what, what, what you see, what your eyes see, so maybe there are buildings, there are other vehicles, there are trees, poles, other pedestrian and so on, right? So it's the real world is not as simple as simply giving an image and getting an output as a class label, right? You can have multiple objects within a single image and they, they can be at uh, different locations. So you also need, uh, by you we mean the machine which actually is equipped with a camera, it can be a vehicle, it can be a robot, right? So it is from that perspective that we are having this discussion, right? So if you want to go beyond classification <clears throat> and solve some problems and in some of the problems uh, that we'll be discussing, uh, the first one is semantic segmentation, right? Now, what is semantic segmentation? In this, you have a label for every pixel in the image, right? For example, what you see, uh, maybe all the yellow pixels, they correspond to a cat, all the green part that corresponds to grass and then trees and so on, right? So you will have a label for every pixel in the image, which is called semantic segmentation. Then you have a relatively simple problem, which is called classification plus localization, right? How is it different from classification? In classification, you give an image and you say it's a cat, right? But in classification plus localization, we still assume that there is a single object in the image, but in addition to the label of that object, to the class of that object, we also need to give the location of that object within the image. Right? like a bounding box that where that object is appearing in an image. Then you have object detection in which there is no constraint of a single object. You can have multiple objects within a single image, right? And we expect that the system would um, give us the locations of each of these objects. For example, there are three objects and the label of each of the objects that, okay, this one is a dog, this one is a dog, and this is a cat, right? So this is basically a challenging problem because you do not know in advance that how many objects are present. Um, it can be any number of objects and not only you need to give their labels, but also their location. Then a problem which is similar to semantic segmentation is instance segmentation, right? Uh, 
uh, in which again you are uh, telling uh, at pixel level the, the 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 levels of class but the difference between semantic segmentation and instance segmentation is that in semantic segmentation we do not make a discrimination between multiple objects of the same category right for example if we are doing semantic segmentation then you see this is one cow and then you have another cow right but if you are doing semantic segmentation so since it's the same class label so all of these pixels they are labeled as cow irrespective of the fact that there are two instances of the cow on the other hand instead of semantic segmentation if we were doing instance segmentation then maybe we this part will get a different label maybe cow one and this part will get a different label cow two right so this difference is important that in semantic segmentation we do not discriminate between multiple instances of the same class while in instance segmentation we make a discrimination right so this was just uh, an introduction of what are the different problems right now what we'll see in the perspective of uh, these problems we'll start our discussion with classification plus localization because this is the simplest uh, case uh, this we'll see today where we assume that there is a single object uh, and we need to find the class label and the location of that object then we'll move to object detection there are many many object detection but um, i have chosen three right which are actually related uh, which is rcnn fast rcnn and fast rcnn right then we see one example from semantic segmentation which is uh, fcn which stands for fully convolutional network right and then you have other object detectors which are for real time which are very fast right so maybe if we have some time we can touch this one you know because uh, this is uh, you can say a standard object detector that is uh, very commonly used today right so i think we'll have some time so we can touch yolo as well right okay so <clears throat> now let's um, start our discussion with this first block which is classification plus localization okay so when we say localization localization formally means identifying the location of an object in the image that where that object appears right and of course if the class is not known then not only you need to find the location for example this red box is the location of object but you also need to output the label that there is an object at this location but what is that object it is cat okay so basically when you are dealing with such system you will have a predefined classes for example 20 classes like a cat and a dog and so on right and then there is an additional class which is for the background so background simply means that none of these is present here right because it is possible that none of the objects is uh, present in the image so in that case you will have uh, an extra class which is called background okay so now when you are designing a system for classification plus localization now what are the different uh, outputs that you expect from your model right so you see uh, for the uh, for the cl classification you simply need class label right so this is what you are already doing in classification but in addition to that now you will need four numbers now what are these four numbers these four numbers are actually describing your bounding box there are different ways to describe a bounding box but the common one is that you take the x and y coordinate of this point which is the top left corner and then you have the width of the box and you have height of this box right sometimes you will take the center point that is also a convention but in most of the literature you will have the coordinates x and y coordinates of this top left point so you have these two numbers and then you have width and heights two more numbers so it means that you are predicting five things four numbers plus one label okay previously you were only predicting one label once you were solving the classification problem okay now let's say we i ask you to solve classification plus localization problem but i don't give you any new algorithm okay i say whatever you have studied so far you only have to use that knowledge and maybe you have to come up with a solution maybe a brute force solution which can solve this problem right so you see without any new knowledge we can somehow still solve this problem although it would be very inefficient but we can do that let's see how we can solve this problem using brute force okay so suppose you want to detect a car in an image so what you can do is 
you can take a window you can slide that window over the image okay so whenever you have a window you you take it from the image you already have classification available like cnn you feed this window to cnn it will say whether there is a car or no car okay so you see this existing machinery is your classifier okay you already know how to classify so although it is a very bad way of solving this problem but this is the first solution that that one can think of only with the existing knowledge that i have a classification machinery available so if i have to solve the localization problem so i can extract uh, windows from this image i can feed those windows uh, to a classifier and whenever my classifier says there is a car so i will pick that window and of course i will have the location not exact but some approximate location of the object as well as the label of the object uh now let's let's discuss uh, this solution in more detail suppose we are trying to uh, find a cat in an image and we are placing different uh, windows on the image so you see there are many locations where your classifier will think there is a cat right so for example um, there are four different boxes which are suggesting that there is a cat in this location but every position will have an associated probability the classification score right so you see um, if there are many overlapping boxes so out of those you can keep only one box which is giving you the highest probability so in this case i have four boxes which are overlapped with probabilities 0 0.5 0 0.6 0 0.75 and 0.8 so you see i will keep only one box which is giving me the maximum probabilities and i will remove all because they are all referring to the same region of the image so whatever i have told you technically this is called non maxima suppression right now what is non maxima suppression again you have uh, multiple boxes all of these are saying there is a face in this region right but you see if i have a box i have another box and the overlap of these boxes is greater than some threshold right because if i have a box like this and another box like this then it is possible that i have a different object here different object here right some person here some person here this overlap is very small this discussion is only meaningful when we have a significant overlap like we have a one box like this and the box like this so this is the overlap region so if my overlap is significant where overlap is greater than some threshold so what i will do out of all these three or four rectangles i will only keep one box and based on the probability so if i have three different probabilities i will keep the box which is giving me the highest probability this is called non maxima suppression and i will be repeatedly using this terminology throughout the uh, discussion today as well as in the next week right so please keep in mind what we mean by non maxima suppression okay so now you see again if we come back to analyze our solution Uh, an obvious problem that you can find with that solution is that how do you know the size of the object right means what is the correct size of the window so that it would always contain the object because for example if you are trying to detect a dog we don't know the size of the dog so whether your window size would be this or this or something else you you have no clue right there is a solution to that as well what you can do you can um, resize the image at multiple scales right which is called building a pyramid that you have image at original size then you reduce by 2 by 2 again by 2 right and then you have a window so you keep on moving this window and we expect that there would be some scale on which the object would be contained within the window right so either you can resize the image or you can also resize the windows you say okay i will i will have these different size windows with different sizes as well as different aspect ratios and you hope that there would be some window size in which the object would be contained within the uh, box and it will give me some high probability so i will put that as the location of that image right so you see this solution seems okay but this is very very inefficient right why because you have multiple sizes of image you have to slide windows on the complete image and of course maybe you prefer overlapping windows so that you don't miss anything and then you have to perform classification in each window right because you have a trained model you feed it to classify so you see you can you can guess that this is not something that is going to work 
theoretically it can work, but practically maybe it, it, it will give you some good results, but it is very, very slow. It would be very, very slow. You can already uh, see from all of the steps that I have told you, right? Now the solution to this uh, is that what we do is that we used our existing machinery for classification and for the localization, instead of trying to find the location by different windows, we treat localization as a regression problem, right? Now, what is a regression problem? Just to recall you, that in regression, we output a number instead of a class, right? Regre output of a regressor is a real number. So what you can do is that you can train a regressor, which gives you four numbers as an output, okay? And how will you train it? It's very easy. When you have the ground truth data, you will also have the correct location in the training data. Okay, so you will have the location of this cat. So you will have four numbers like uh, maybe x true, y true, w true, and hi true. Okay, and then your neural network will also predict four numbers, maybe x predicted, y predicted, w predicted, and h predicted. Okay, so you can easily compute the loss, like uh, maybe if you are using L2 norm, you can do this. So this would be your loss function, right? You just take the difference and take the scare and you can use it, sorry, H target minus H predicted plus width target minus width predicted. Okay, so you can actually do it for all the training example and eventually uh, the neural network can learn to predict the correct set of right, uh, correct set of four numbers, right? So you see, instead of sliding windows, uh, when you train the system, your training data will have the correct location of the bounding boxes. Your uh, network, when it is initialized randomly, it will give some random four coordinates and you can use L2 norm as the loss function and you can tune the model, which learns to predict the correct location. Now, if we combine these two, so, what we do is we can add two branches to our existing convolutional model, right? So this was the image you have a sequence of uh, convolution and pooling layer. This is any architecture you are using. And after the convolutional layers, you see we have two different branches. This branch is the classifier head or the classifier branch where you can have few fully connected layer. And eventually if you have 20 classes, so you will have 21 neurons here. Right, 20 plus one, why plus one? Because one is for the background, but if there is no object, then the background would be on, right? And here you are using softmax, uh, uh, just like we do regularly, right? And this is the second branch, which is the regressor. And here it is, what is it outputting? It is outputting four numbers, which is X, Y, width, and height, right? So you will have one loss coming from here, one loss coming from here, and once you back propagate it here, you can take a weighted combination like maybe 0.5 of uh, loss uh, of classifier plus 0.5 loss of regressor or any other weights that you want to do. Uh, you, can, you can choose any weights, right? And that would be your total loss and you'll be using um, gradient descent to uh, learn the correct values of weights, right? So now you see if we, <clears throat> if we train such a model, then of course, uh, this part, the classifier part, okay, this part is shared between both of these, right? There is some part only which is different for these two tasks, right? So the classification branch of the network will be telling you that, okay, it's a dog, right? And this part will be giving you four coordinates, right? So when you combine these two pieces of information, so the output would be that there's a dog in the image at which location, at a box, whose top left point is at x, y, and the width and height are these, right? So you see now we are able to uh, not only tell that there's a dog in the image, but we are also able to, able to tell uh, the location, right? But I'm just uh, recalling that in this problem, we are assuming there's a single object in the image, right? When we say classification with localization, we are having a hard constraint that there's only one object in the image, only for those problems it will work, right? And <clears throat> something new that you have seen, uh, which you see on the top of the screen is a multitask loss function. Multitask loss function means there are two tasks. One is classification, other is regression. 
and you have a classification loss, you have a regression loss, you combine them together, that gives you the total loss, right? So it is a multitask loss function that you, you are trying to optimize two different loss functions, right? One is for the classifier, the other is for the regressor. So this is again a terminology that you will be uh, repeatedly hearing from me as well as from the literature, right? So when we say multitask loss function, it simply means you have more than one loss function which you are combining uh, to get the uh, total loss of that value. Okay, <clears throat> now before proceeding, we should also be able to tell uh, how to evaluate such system, right? And what is the evaluation metric? Because in case of classification, it is straightforward. If it's a dog uh, and your system says it's a dog, it is correct classification. If the system says it's something else, it is wrong classification, right? But in case of detection, you see uh, it is not very straightforward. So there are many metrics, but the most common metric that you will see uh, is called IOU, that is intersection over union, right? So there's a box which is predicted by your system, right? And there's a box which is the ground truth. For example, in, in the picture that you see on the screen, the blue box is the ground truth and the red box is the one that is predicted by your system. So if we want to tell how good the prediction is, so what we can do is we can take the area of overlap, which is this region, and we take the area of union, right? So this number is called intersection over union, right? So what we want that ideally, if there's a perfect overlap, so the intersection, whatever is the intersection, the same is the union. So you get a one. Right, but that is very rare. Uh, that is not possible. So just to give you an idea how IOU works, right? So these are few cases where IOU is like 0.5, right? Here IOU is 0.7. And if you are expecting IOU of 0.9, you see it is like near to perfect segmentation. So normally we, we don't uh, go too strict. We say, okay, if IOU is greater than 0.5 or 0.6, we, we consider it a correct uh, localization. Right? because it is very difficult that you have exactly the same bounding box as that of the ground truth. So you say, okay, even if the IOU is greater than 0.5 or 0.6, then we say we can assume safely assume that the system is correctly able to uh, localize uh, the, the object, right? Okay, <clears throat> now, so now you have a mechanism which you can use uh, to perform classification plus localization, right? But now you see it was a fairly simple problem. Now actually you can have multiple objects within the same image, which is relatively more close to what you expect in a real world scenario, okay? Which is called object detection, right? So today we'll see one object detector and maybe the remaining we can see in the next week. So now we are actually, what you saw classification plus localization, that was the preamble so that we can, uh, it, it can lead us to object detection, okay? So if we talk of object detection before deep learning, <clears throat> so there were many computer vision experts who designed many features, and then those features were fed to a classifier to, to actually detect objects uh, in an image, right? For example, one of the very famous uh, feature was HOG, which is called histogram of oriented gradients, which was designed to detect pedestrian or humans in an image, right? But later on, of course, it was used for other objects as well. So Basically, what they did was that uh, they will use sliding windows and then they compute hop features and feed to SVM or any other classifier and tell whether there's an object or not, right? So this is the general idea that how uh, before deep learning uh, classification, sorry, object detection was being performed that you had any feature as a case study I have told you hog, but it could be any feature, any classifier. So you see again, handcrafted features and conventional classifier, which is performing object detection. So the problem with this was that uh, if you see the results before object detection of object detection before deep learning, then you see the performance is not very good. Right? So this is basically uh, an illustration which is taken from this paper. Uh, I'll come back to this paper later. So th these are the performances of some of the object detectors using traditional computer vision techniques, right? And mostly the data set that was used for object detection was Pascal VOC, right? Just like for classification, uh, the goal data set was ImageNet, which had 1000 classes. For object detection for many years, 
now we have many other data set, but in the beginning for many years, Pascal VOC was the standard data set, just like ImageNet was standard for classification. And Pascal VOC, I think it had 20 classes, right? 20 different objects. So the number of classes is relatively limited, but you see, since you have to find location as well, so the problem was not very easy, right? So now you see, after DL, um, when convolutional neural networks were used for object detection, uh, it was in 2014, 13, 14, right? So you see all of a sudden the performance has jumped, right? Here we, if you see the slope of this line and the slope of this line, you see, so there's a significant difference. I mean, the performance has continued to improve over the years and improved very, uh, you can say efficiently and quickly uh, as we have migrated to deep learning based object detectors. Okay, <clears throat> now say, what if we try to solve object detection problem using the same technique that we use for um, object classification plus localization, right? So, okay, maybe it can work, uh, but let's see what are the problem. If I have this image, so I need to output one class label and four numbers, right? Because there is one object. If this is my input, I need three class labels and 16 numbers. 12 numbers, right? Four into three, 12 numbers. And then if I have this image, then you see for every object, I need a bonding box. So I have maybe 10 or 12 uh, labels. And for each label, I have four numbers, right? So you see here, I need four numbers. Maybe here I need 12 numbers. And here I need say 48 numbers or anything. So we don't know in advance that how many objects would be there in an image each image will have different number of outputs, right? But you see, this is not possible. Means I cannot have a neural network uh, in which sometimes I have only four numbers and sometimes I have 48 numbers, right? So if we try to apply the same, <clears throat> uh, you can say technique, which we were using in object uh, localization plus classification, then since the number of objects is not known, will end up in a problem, right? That how many neurons should we have at the last layer because it will depend on the number of objects, right? Okay, now uh, if we go a step back, we say, okay, let's go back to the sliding window approach where you have a classifier available, which is trained on 20, 21 classes. So you slide a window and then you say <clears throat> whether there's an object or not, right? So for example, if we are detecting object, we place window here, we say, whether there's a dog or cat or background, we have only two objects, right? Cat and dog and the third category is background. So maybe in this image, your network would say there's a background, right? Similarly, when you say, put it here, so it will say, yes, there's a dog and so on, right? But you see, again, this brute force approach uh, has the same problems that we discussed that objects can appear at any location at any scale in the image, right? So we, we don't know how to choose the size of this box. So maybe we will have to choose many different sizes at many different aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is the ratio of weight to height, okay? And then we'll end up, uh, we may end up with detecting these objects. Right? <clears throat> so a solution to that, when you are solving object detection uh, problem, a solution that was proposed uh, in the later part of 2013 is that first we can extract region proposals in an image. Now, what are region proposals? Region proposals are like blobs, right? Which are likely to contain object. For example, um, you can, and this generation of region proposal, uh, this is not based on any deep learning, right? This is based on conventional computer vision algorithm, where you can use any algorithm, X, Y, Z, which will give you some boxes of different sizes where the algorithm thinks there's a blob. Blob means a, a collection of pixels. Or in other words, the, the algorithm thinks that there is some object present, right? For example, one of the very famous algorithms is selective search. We'll not go into details of selective search because it is a, a typical computer vision algorithm. But um, the idea is that you, if you apply selective search on this image, uh, it will produce around near to 2000 proposals, right? Means it will give you near to 2000 boxes of different sizes where it thinks some object can be present, right? So you see uh, this number 2000 is a bit too high, right? Because it is rare that a single image will have 2000 objects. But the idea is that you will have different sizes, different location, 
and the objective is to have a very high recall. High recall means that we can afford many false boxes, but we don't want to miss anything, right? Means if something is missed, that is a serious problem. If we have something which is not containing any object, that is okay because that will be eliminated in the subsequent steps, right? So the first application of uh, deep learning um, that was, that was, you can say, uh, using convolutional networks for object detection. What they did was, for this region proposal, they compared different methods uh, from computer vision that which of the methods they should use to generate these proposal, right? The table that you see on your screen has been taken from their paper, where these are the different methods they compared. And out of these, they eventually chose this method, which is called selective search, right? They did a comparison of all of these methods. So now we formally come to this uh, first application of CNNs to object detection, which is called RCNN, right? An important thing is that about an hour ago, we saw something which is called CRNN, right? And now we are looking at RCNN. So please do not confuse these two. CRNN is CNN plus RNN. Right, which we saw in the beginning where we were solving image classification problem and so on, right? Now, what we are looking at now is RCNN. This R is for region, okay? Region, because we'll be proposing region. So this is region-based convolutional neural network, right? So CRN, CRNN and RCNN, they have um, similar characters, but they are two totally different concepts, right? And in many of the exams, I actually give this as a question that what is the difference between CRNN and RCNN, right? So you should be ready for a question like that. Okay, anyways, coming back to this <clears throat> RCNN, which is short for region-based convolutional neural network, the key idea was that using some computer vision algorithm like selective search, we find the region proposal, which are small parts in the original image, which are likely to contain an object, right? We don't know what object, but they are likely to contain some object. So the boxes that you see here, right? Maybe these are the region proposals. Now what we do, we take each of these boxes, we resize them to a fixed size and we can feed them to a CNN, okay? It, is a, it can be a pre-trained CNN or it can be fine-tuned, whatever you like. And then from the output of CNN, what they did was they again had two branches one is the SVM classifier, which is giving you that what object is present in this box. If there is no object, it will say it's a background, okay? And it has a second branch, which is the regressor, just like we saw, right? So this branch SVM is telling you what object is in this box. This regressor is giving you the location of that box, right? So this is the general uh, architecture of RCNN. So let's uh, see some more technical details that how things are actually working. Okay, so as we told you that <clears throat> the first step of our CNN is to generate region proposals, which are bonding boxes which can contain region. And after a comp comprehensive study, the authors have chosen this algorithm selective search. How does selective search wor uh, works? We don't need many details, but just to give you an idea, it will group pixels together based on texture, color, intensity, right? Uh, for example, you see this, this is one group, this is another group and so on. Right, So it is some computer vision algorithm, the details uh, of which we don't need to know. All we need to know is that it will cluster pixels together based on their texture and color, and it will give you near to 2000 bonding boxes, right? For example, uh, you see these are some of the bonding boxes that have been shown on the images, right? That these are uh, the locations where the algorithm thinks that some object may be present, some object, what object? It will not tell you. It will say maybe some object is present. And of course, many of these boxes would be overlapping as well. Okay, now is the important part. Once you have those say 2000 boxes, what you do, uh, you will resize each box to a fixed size. Why fixed size? Because CNN needs a fixed size image, right? So they have chosen this size of two to seven, two to seven by three, which is the same as that of AlexNet, right? And then once you have the box resize, they pass it through a modified version of AlexNet, right? It's more or less similar with some modifications, right? So you already know 
in elixnet you have 4096 and then uh, 1000 layers uh, classes here right but since this data set does not have 1000 classes this data set only has 20 classes uh, plus one for the background right so what they did was they actually changed this layer instead of 1000 they had 20 classes and they had to fine tune this network so that they can update or learn the weights of this new layer right so this is one modification that had to be made because elixnet had 1000 classes and the data set with which they were dealing they were only uh, you can say uh, 20 classes plus one for the background now what they did was that once the model was fine tuned they passed all of the boxes through this model and every box was mapped to a vector of 4096 okay now what they did was you see it is very inefficient but this is what they did that now once they have these features they trained a new classifier which was svm in the original paper to tell you what object it was right means now they are basically first they are fine tuning the network but instead of using the network for getting the class label, they used a separate classifier, which is which seems quite inefficient because they could have used the last layer for classification as well, but this is not what they did. Uh, they used a separate classifier, which was SVM, which would tell you what object it is, right? So this is basically this branch, okay? This, this SVM, which is telling you what object it is. And for the location, uh, it's a bounding box regressor, just like you have, uh, you have seen previously, that the regressor will output four numbers which uh, which are like uh, x y coordinates and the uh, width and height of the bounding box okay now so if uh, we will see it stepwise but this is the diagram from their paper uh, that you have some input image you have region proposal you resize every uh, proposal to a fixed size you feed it to a cnn and then you feed it to an svm for classification right so if we if we see these steps one by one again so uh, they say, okay, you take a pre-trained network like AlexNet, right? And uh, what you do is first you feed your image uh, to the selective search, which will give you around 2000 boxes per image, right? You will change the last layer of uh, AlexNet from 4096 into 2000 to 4096 into 21, right? This 21 is because we have 20 classes plus one for the background. Then you need to fine tune, right? Because this is a newly added layer. This was not there previously. So it means there are no weights here. So you, they fine tuned it, right? And once you are fine tuning it, right? So you see your data would be labeled. Okay, so as I told you that every time your, you, your output has 0.5 IOU or greater than 0.5 IOU with the ground truth, it would be uh, considered a correct identification, right? Because it is very difficult to have a IOU of like 0.9 or one is almost impossible. So if IOU is greater than 0.5, uh, your algorithm would consider it as a correct, uh, you can say, uh, localization, right? Okay, so now once you have uh, the model fine-tuned, so what they did, uh, which I also asked you in, 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 in a quiz that how do you use a pretend model as a feature extractor? So once the model was fine tuned, they, they feed all the boxes to the model and they convert every box into a vector of 4096, right? So once you have, for every box, you have these, uh, these vectors which have been saved. Now there's an SVM, right? Which was trained on positive and negative examples of each category, right? For example, if you want to uh, learn dog, then all of these are, negative examples for dog because they do not contain a dog and this is a positive example for dog right so once the svm is trained then finally uh, there's a regressor uh, which is giving you uh, four numbers as an output of the uh, of telling you the location of that bounding box right so now this this is again uh, a summary of those steps you have region proposals feature extraction svm and bounding box regression right so the first thing is um, every, you can say bounding box is converted into a feature vector. And then this feature vector is classified by SVM. That Okay, it has a high probability of dog. So maybe it's a dog. And finally, uh, the region proposal will not be a perfect bounding box, right? It, it will be something like this, for example, it is not an ideal. So the bounding box regressor will actually fix this bounding box and give you uh, a better localization, right? 
because the region proposal will only give you an approximate bounding box, right? So now you see it, 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 this particular paper became very popular uh, because it was the first application of um, convolutional networks to, to, to object detection. But uh, you see there are many shortcomings that uh, you can identify, right? Um, the most obvious is that you see there are three different trainings involved. First, they are fine tuning the CNN, right? Then they throw away the classifier and they use SVM for classification, right? So SVM will need a separate training and then the regressor will need yet another training, right? So you see there are, you can, you can consider them three different training that first you are fine tuning, then you are training uh, the, the SVM for classification and then you are separately training the regressor. So that's why this was, um, this was very, very slow. Once they trained it, I don't remember exactly, but it took more than 80 hours in training, right? And okay, you can say training is one time, so we can afford 80 hours, right? Uh, it is not uh, too much. But another problem was that even at test time, for a single image, it was taking 47 seconds. So you see this, this is some, something which is not acceptable. If I feed it one image to detect object, if it is taking near to one minute, then if I have to process a complete video, in a video we have 25 frames per second. Even if you process one frame per second, then you see this is this is way far from what we expect from a uh, real-time application, right? So actually that is why practically um, no one uses this, okay? So this RCNN, you can say the authors maybe quickly want to apply this and publish it, so they did, but Instantly, they realized these problem and they actually uh, improved it, which we'll see in the next week, right? So they improved it. They addressed all these shortcomings, which we have identified that why we have so many uh, different trainings, why we are, we are using SVM, we could have used the same network for classification as well, right? So what uh, soon after this paper was published, the authors actually improved this to fast RCNN, right? Which was addressing all of these problems. And later, uh, there were still some problem with in fast RCNN, which was which were later addressed in another model, which was named faster RCNN, right? So these two models we'll be looking at in the next week, right? So now maybe we can spare some time for discussion because uh, this was a long uh, session uh, of classification plus localization and object detection using faster RCNN, right? So for your convenience, maybe I can flash uh, the, the, the illustration, which is giving you a complete summary of RCNN so that if you want to discuss anything, we can do that, right? So please, if you have any queries, we can discuss those, thank you.